Hello, welcome to the Freedom from Anger podcast. I'm joined today with Marty Maidenberg. He's a psychotherapist in New York City. And he's here today to talk to us about transitions in life. How are you doing today, Marty? I'm doing well, James. How are you? I'm doing good, doing good. So w- we talked briefly yesterday about transitions in life and how it's a huge part of life because everything is always changing. So mm-hmm. when you have somebody that, that comes to you for assistance, What's some advice that you give them? Well, you know, people come to me at all different points in their lives for various transitions that they're going through. And the first thing I try to tell people is that it's it's normal to go through transitions. Basically, everything is a transition in your life, whether it's getting older, becoming a parent, getting married, dealing with grief, buying a home, changing a job. It's all some sort of change for you. And along with change comes stress and the unexpected, which makes everyone just anxious. So first things first is that what you're going through is probably not unique. It's unique to you, but there are ways of dealing with different types of transitions. But when people go through such a change, what's happening is their usual benchmarks or things that they look to to keep themselves grounded are being either taken away or replaced. You're in a new situation. You're in a different neighborhood. The job is different. You're married. You're divorced. And so it's important to start developing as quickly as you can your own new set of benchmarks to look at. There's sort of signs that you can look at to say, okay, I'm here, I'm safe. I know what I'm doing. So developing a routine right out of the gate is probably the most helpful thing you can do. And that could be waking up at the same time every day and making your bed, or it could mean every Saturday going and getting a coffee at this one new coffee house. It's about trying to prepare yourself for the idea that things are going to be different for you. These sort of changes are either very small or they can be very large. Small things, it's, it's you know, moving, which is not a small thing, retiring, or let's say changing a job or losing a job. What you've gotten used to on a daily basis is the same thing that makes you comfortable, that allows you to take chances because you're not afraid of what may happen if you try something new. But when you're changing, everything seems to be a bit of a challenge. And so I'm going to stop here because I feel like I'm rambling and ask you if if that's okay so far. Oh, no, no, definitely. I certainly do you think that we are creatures of habit? We like routine. We like structure, even though a lot of us say we don't, but in reality, we do kind of get into a groove and something changes. Like you said, it could be anything from moving to work or whatever. It tends to Mm -hmm. have us kind of spiral out of control for a little while. We don't know what to do because it's different. It's something new and Yeah, I definitely think that, like you said, finding those routines, even if it's just something small, be consistent with it. You should have more control. If it's waking up at a certain time, making a bed, going to a certain place every week. You just said the magic word for most people, which is control. And most of us like to have control over what we're doing. And we like to have control, not because we're power hungry, but because it's comforting. When we know what's happening, we feel like we're in control. And so you want to prepare whenever you can for a transition, making sure you have an outline of what's going to change, but then have some, you know, care and, and kindness for yourself and realize you're not going to do everything perfectly. 
something's going to be different that you don't know about that you haven't experienced before. So set some reasonable expectations for yourself in terms of this is what you're going to be facing. This is what you may try to do. And it may not work out that way. And that's not failure. That's trial and error. When you don't know something, you've got to try, you've got to try something without knowing what there is, is going to be. And so be a little gentle with yourself to say, okay, I may have messed this up, but how else would I have known unless I tried that? So I think just accepting that you have a window of opportunity to try new things and some of them will work and some of them won't, it's a big deal. Another major thing for a transition, find your support system. Who do you talk to about these things? Who's the first person you call when you have a bad day? Is it your spouse? Is it a friend? Is it family? Keep them close, whether it's phone calls or, or seeing them. It grounds you. Again, we're talking about the the anxiety that comes with not knowing. And so a support system keeps you grounded to things that you know, people that support you, that can keep you positive, and also give you other ideas. Everyone loves to offer their opinions on things, but if you're getting your ideas from a variety of sources, more things to try, more things to potentially work for you. So that also ties into something I find very important when you're dealing with a change, which is how you talk to yourself. Me as a psychotherapist, words are extremely important. So how we talk to ourselves is really very negative or positive experience. So as an example, you know, most of us, if you take a your house keys out and you go to put the key in the door of your house and you drop your keys, a lot of us will say, oh, of course I dropped my keys. Then you got to think about it. Of course is not really the answer. Of all the times you tried to open your front door with keys, this is the exception. 99% of the time, it's not, of course I dropped my keys. It's, of course I opened the door. So we don't want to focus just on the Thing that goes wrong and say, oh, look at me, I can't do this. It's really about positioning yourself for success where you say, oh yeah, well, this isn't, this is strange because this doesn't usually happen to me. You're going to have a lot of that when you go through transitions. Oh, this never happened to me. Well, you've never done this before. You've never been at this job before. You've never had to grieve someone or deal with someone's death. These are all new things. So start off on the right foot by telling yourself, it's okay if I mess up. Most of the time, I'm going to get it right. Yeah, the whole positive and negative self-talk is definitely huge. Unfortunately, we tend to have a negative bias, and we always lean towards the negative, and a lot of us we don't realize that if you ask somebody, who do you talk to the most? And they'll put out a name and say, no, you talk to yourself the most in a day, day to day basis. Exactly. So exactly. You have, to, you have to be wary of how you're talking to yourself. And the people that I work with, I'm like, look at it like it's like flip the coin. Uh, it could be positive, it could be negative. It costs the exact same. So why do you always want to go negative? When you can assume or think positive and uh -huh. who knows, it, it might work out and it's going to be a whole lot less stress and worry on, on your body because there's a lot of things in life that we, we don't have control over. The majority of life we have no control over. Exactly. Exactly. But, what I tell most of my clients is if you're worried about something in the future, but you have no control over it. You have a choice between now and when the event happens, you can either think positively about it or negatively. But if you choose to think negatively from the time you start thinking to the time that it happens, nothing is going to change because of that negative thinking. You're just going to have spent all that time on something that you can't really control or feel until you get there. And you're going to be dragging it along with you. So 
something else I tell clients when they come in and say, I've had a really bad day. I say, have you had a really bad day or did you have a really bad 10 minutes that you turned into a day? Because most of us just have one thing that happens and then everything is tainted by that. And it's the same thing with change. If you have to expect something to go wrong and not make it, this was a terrible experience or I, I hate this. This is so bad. Expect failure at certain things, but overall you're going to have a better experience if you're able to positively access these words in your head that are, I'm trying, I'm doing my best. This is going to work out rather than beating up on yourself and telling yourself this is a bad thing. And then it just keeps snowballing into something where it's, I don't like where I am. So it's, it's a big, big part of it. But I love what you said about the person we speak to the most is ourselves. It's a great line and very yeah. true. Yeah. I had a guy podcast oh, a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about his experience. He came down with Julian Barr syndrome and he was paralyzed and he made a point when he was in the hospital and he's like, he said, he got so bad where I couldn't even turn my head to see who's walking in. He said, instead of looking at it negatively, he said, this didn't happen to me. This happened for me. And, and he came out, and of course he came out of it, but yeah, it's really hard for a lot of us. If we're in a situation or for our health deteriorates to put that positive spin on it. <laughs> this happened for me. Huh. Because he did learn from it and put everything in perspective and went on to write a book about his life. So it's actually a really good book if you ever get a chance. It's called Confessions of a Hollywood Trainer. So that's what he did. He still does training. Very oh. interesting. But uh, yeah, transition, change, like the old saying goes, the only thing constant is change. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just part of life and... Going back to the positive and negative self-talk, and another example that I give is I'm not a big gambler, but if I were to go to a casino, my favorite is the roulette wheel because you can bet on red or black, 50-50 <laughs> shot. That's the best odds you're going to get in Vegas, 50-50. <laughs> and same thing with the, the positive and negative. It's 50-50, it's so you might as well lean more towards the positive. So some... We talk about transitioning, but like you said, it could be anything from a job. It could be a loss of a loved one. I'm sure you probably get a lot of people that's dealing with grief. And what's yeah. some of the advice that you give somebody that's, say, suffering from the loss of a loved one? What are some coping skills that, that would benefit? Mm -hmm. I think you know, dealing with the loss of a loved one or, or a close one is such a unique experience to everyone, but there are certain things that you can keep in mind to help yourself get through. First of all, acknowledge that there's a void here, something that you had, that you knew, someone that you relied on is no longer there. And you are allowed to feel however you want about that. And it's not going to be a quick fix. People can be upset at first. People can hold it together. But over the course of a year, when you're dealing with this is the first Christmas without this person, this is the first Father's Day without my father, these are things that are going to affect you throughout the year. So don't beat up on yourself for not getting out of it too quickly or for feeling sad. And on the same note, it's not a disservice or disrespectful to move on with your life in certain ways where you can actually smile. The person that you are grieving probably would not want you to be taking all of this time lamenting the loss of them. It really is saying anything you are feeling, anything you're thinking is valid. Your feelings are good. 
And like any other transition, start looking for new things to hold on to, establish those new benchmarks. So you want to talk with someone about your loss. You don't want to have your entire day taken up and affecting how you go through your day. Sometimes that seems impossible, but I like to talk with people about grief windows. And by that, I mean, if you find that you are going on and on grief, and now the DSM, which categorizes disorders, they actually have now a grief disorder. After a certain amount of time, they say it's something that you need to take care of. And that's usually after 12 months. But immediately after losing someone, you're going to find that you are having these thoughts and emotions popping up at all different times. You could be in the shower, you could be in your car, and they seem uncontrollable. So there we go back to that word again, control. And what I like to do with these grief windows is whenever you're feeling these spiraling thoughts or emotions, and you feel that it's to a point that it's heightened that you can't really function, Take yourself out of the situation you're in, find a place by yourself and set a timer for 20 minutes. And then within those 20 minutes, pour everything you can into that. Every negative thought, every sad thought, go for it. Just on and on and on. When 20 minutes, when the buzzer goes off or the alarm goes off, you say to yourself, okay, I don't think I'm done with this, but I'm going to do this window again later on tonight, seven o'clock tonight, I'm going to do this. But right now I've thought of everything that I can and I've got to move on to the next thing. What the grief windows do is it creates a before and an after for the grieving. The important thing is you're not denying yourself to do that. You can do it again. You can do it as often as you want. But it's to create time where you can actually move on with your life without letting go of that pain or those thoughts. And so in the afternoon, if you feel something starting to come on, you can say, okay, I'm going to put this into the seven o'clock time when I'm doing this, when I'm by myself and I can put some real thought into it. So it's a way of not taking that grief and stretching it out over the whole day. But grief is extremely rattling. It is a total realignment of your world in some cases, how you define yourself by other people. And it's, it's more of an opportunity to show how you feel about that person, what effect they had on you, good and bad how your life changes without them. And then it's about acceptance. You know, we talk about, you know, the five stages of grief. I think the most important one is you have to accept that this has happened. You have to accept that you are going to be changed because of it, but also that your life goes on and it will be different and you will carry this with you but your life will mean something to you because of this loss. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, definitely. That acceptance is huge in every part of life. And when you lose somebody that's close and you struggle with grief, I know for me personally, when my mom passed away several years ago, I tried to ignore it and just tried to like tough my way through it. But, Still to this day, I have those bouts where I just will have just a breakdown. And like you said, just allowing yourself to have those moments is it, it, huge because for years and years, I try to fight it. And like you said, it really put things in perspective when I was like, basically, if she was still around, she probably wouldn't want me acting the way I'm acting and doing what I'm doing and using her as an excuse. Mm-hmm. So... Right. And that was a, definitely a huge, huge moment in my life when I was like, all right, you got to get your act together. And I was not acting the 
the greatest at the time. How old you, were you at the time? I was 24. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's no easy age. No, and she passed away on Mother's Day. So that was like mm. icing. Okay, I guess she did that on purpose, so she makes sure I remember every year. <laughs> remember. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was in the military. I was in the Marines at the time. So I had to mm-hmm. drive eight hours back home on Mother's Day. And it was, it was a tough go. I still had a, another year left in. So, and just kind of <laughs> act, acted a fool to put it nicely. <laughs> well, you know, it, there's a way to look at it that when you get set and when you find yourself spiraling and sad that that's telling you and showing how much you cared about the person that's how much you cared about your mother that the grief is so impactful every time there's a cry or a breakdown you're in a way showing your love for your mom and uh, it's just a different way to look at it it doesn't make it any easier but you're sort of honoring your relationship when you recognize the change that you're about to go through not having her there. So again, it's about acceptance and it's about recognizing the change. Yeah, and it's realizing we're all human. We're going to go through this. My dad, he's still around and still kicking. Not too high, but he's still kicking, but... Just kind of preparing yourself like that. Yeah, yeah. Is it rational to think he's going to live another 20 years? No. I mean, he's 87, so uh, see, he's got a few more years in him. Mm-hmm. But And it, even when you try to prepare yourself, I mean, it's it, it's still going to hurt. It's still going to have an impact. But I mm-hmm. think the, the more you educate yourself, the more you're able to work your way through those those tough times. To educate yourself is it's also you know talk to people about it talk to people that have been through it how did your dad handle your mom's passing he's you know an old school kind of guy really didn't see much of a change but i'm sure uh-huh. he, he was trying to be strong for everybody and but uh, mm-hmm. but it was definitely because they were married for 50 years so Wow. And actually, actually, they just had their 50th wedding anniversary a couple of months before she passed. But she always said there towards the end, she said, I don't care if I have to come back as, as a ghost. We're going to make it to 50 years. And they did. And she passed a couple months later. But, uh, but yeah, it was definitely hard on everybody in the family. And that's the other thing that I'm sure happens to a lot of families when you lose that key piece of the family and the family just kind of goes their separate ways so Mm -hmm. definitely was a transition for for me my dad because everybody kind of dispersed kind of doing doing their own things different reactions whether it's anticipated or not expected or one's going to have their own reaction to it and some people choose to just Go away, run away, not deal with it, not want to deal with it, not want to talk to people. I can only encourage people to talk about it as much as they can. You're going to find out that other people share those feelings and have been through similar events. And it's a nice reminder that there is another side to this. You will come out on the other side, but sometimes you don't have that control. And so it's it's like the water. You want a sunny day and the clouds come by and you're like, sometimes the clouds are going to go away quickly. Sometimes they're going to stay there. But eventually, it's a little hazy, but they will pass. And you'll know that they'll come back again. Those feelings are going to come back again. But you get used to it. And not that that's a pleasant thing to think about, but it's a normal, natural outcome of grief that or change in general, that there will be something that comes next. I talked to, talk to people about 
when they go down and they spiral and they think the worst things, and that happens a lot when you're transitioning, it's like, uh uh-oh, what if that voice in your head starts saying, well, this could be really bad. What if it all falls apart? And I, again, encourage people to say, well, go there. What happens? Well, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my home. I'm going to lose my relationship. I'm going to be at, at the, in the gutter. And then it's like, and then what? Well, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to be in the gutter. Okay. And then what? Something's going to happen next. You don't stop at the lowest point of your thinking and say, that's it. You have to say, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to come up with something. I'm going to do something. People talk about your life as a book. And I always say, you come to the end of one chapter and it says, it was the worst time of my life. And you turn the page and the next chapter starts off. Three months later, I found myself like, well, what happened to those three months? Those are some pretty bad three months, but we don't talk about it a lot. I'm encouraging people talk about those three months because we all go through it and there's always something that comes next. Oh yeah. That the whole avoidance, avoidance of pain, avoidance of bad times. I don't want to deal with this. And, and like you said, I think looking back, I wish I would have taken the time to talk to somebody. It probably would have saved me a lot of heartache and headache. Uh, through the years but i think a lot of it especially as as men we're less apt to admit that we're hurting Uh admit that we're we're struggling with grief and we got to be strong for everybody but i'm definitely a huge proponent now of go talk to a professional go because when you're going through these transitions, these changes, whether it's grief or, or whatever, just having that person to talk to and to kind of guide you is huge. And just to realize that we don't have all the answers. We like to think we do, but we don't. So yeah. find somebody that you can talk to that's been through similar situations. Everybody's situations are going to be different, but that's kind of like the old somebody says i know how you feel like oh do you you know (laughs) yeah Yeah. okay but yeah like Uh, it's also interesting to uh, also interesting to recognize that our expectations of what normal is are really often quite different reality you know you take marriage and divorce we all think, oh, the white picket fence and the spouse and the dog and the two kids. And then you think about it in the United States, you have like a 47% divorce rate, which leaves 53% married. And of those 53, how many are happy? How many are having affairs? Well, we think that little sliver that's left over of everyone's happy, everyone's great. We're staying married for like your parents 50 years. We think that's normal, but that's the exception. Sorry if that's depressing, but we got to be realistic. The expectation is if you're going with the odds, you're not going to be in a happy marriage or you're going to divorce. And so when you have it, when you have things that are going well, When you're enjoying your life, appreciate it and recognize this isn't the norm. This is special. And most people are going through some difficulties and challenges. And so when you're going through some challenges of your own, you have to recognize, oh, this is normal for other people too. I can talk to other people and they'll understand. They'll get it. So if they are not going through it themselves, Someone else is going through it in their lives and people will be able to relate to you. And that's a way to take care of yourself and make sure you're giving yourself some sort of comfort in a difficult time. That just kind of reminds me when you talk about the, the marriage statistics, there's a comedian, Bill Burr, and he had a joke. He said, he said, 
Well, why, why do I need to get married? He said, the divorce rate's like 50%. He's like, would you go skydiving with those odds? You know, <laughs> give it a 50% chance that your parachute's going to deploy. It's just like, but he, he eventually got married, but that was, was from his early work. Is he still married? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's still married. <laughs> Good for him. He's, he's, he's still married. <laughs> yeah. And then I think he had his first kid when he was like 50 or something. So he's actually got a. Good for him. Yeah. He actually just made a movie. I don't know when it's going to come out, but he wrote it and directed it and everything. And it's called Old Dads. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, he's becoming, he's becoming an example of other people, you know, it, is it the norm to have a kid at 50 and then write and direct a movie about it? No. So he's in <laughs> special category, but people can look to him to say, no, oh, I can have a kid at 50 and I can do things with my life that I didn't expect. Those changes be scary, but, but great for you. Yeah. yeah and it's kind of funny when you go back and look at some of his earlier work and he's talking about not having kids and not being married and that's his whole thing. And then I yeah, guess what? Things change. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Just to kind of wrap up what we'll be talking about is in transitioning. Yeah. Like, like we said, it's work or it's dealing with grief. I think one of the best tools that coming up me, to 50, yeah. that's the uh, transition and it's, you know, that's a life change. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it's a acceptance, acceptance and knowing that you know, stuff's going to happen. We don't have all the answers and we love to assume this and assume that and it makes us feel comfortable to fill in the blank even though we don't have the answers. We're just trying, uh -huh. trying to get through, but accepting that, hey, you might have a flat tire going to work or you might get... I guess, I kid you not, I got pulled over twice in like a week because I had a headlight that was out and then it went out again and I got pulled over again and it was, <laughs> and then I had like a taillight was out. It was just, everything was going on. But I was amazed because when I went a little back at it, I'm going, well, I've not been pulled over that many times, but I do remember the, your heart starts racing and you know, whatever, but these last two times, I was like, okay, pulled over. I was like, I'm sure they have a reason and <laughs> nothing I can do about it now. So whatever I did, it's on me. And it turned out I, I didn't get a ticket or nothing. But you're lucky. Oh. Uh, well, and how you look at it, you can say, I got pulled over and I didn't get a ticket. I'm lucky. Look at it that way instead of I got pulled over because something was wrong. It's like, wow. It was great. People that have a flat tire in the morning. I had a bad day. I had a flat tire. Do you have a flat tire at four in the afternoon? No, I got a fix. Then stop worrying about the flat tire you had this morning. You're having a good afternoon. So yeah. perception. It's all, all about perception and acceptance and just, just allowing life to happen. And don't try to strangle it and hold on to it and and try to bend it to your will because that that's not reality reality is it's it's always going to be changing you there's always do it. something there's always something that's going to pop up unexpected but taking the time to set up a game plan okay well if this happens it could be something is setting aside some money kind of rainy day mm -hmm. fun because we all have cars, we all have houses, something's going to break. Mm -hmm. And the less mm -hmm. stress I can put on myself, oh, well, I've got this money stashed over here for just an occasion versus mm -hmm. I don't have anything saved up. So <laughs> when something happens, it's going to cause mm -hmm. more stress because where am I going to find the money? Which is right. Just you know, small things like Sometimes that. Sometimes it rains and you need the rainy day fund. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Well, all right. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'm sure you got stuff to do today Thank and I, I got to get, get rolling, get started. I, I appreciate the opportunity, James. Hoping, hoping we can make people feel like they're in good hands, even when they don't feel like they're necessarily secure or things aren't 
usual. That's always bad. Oh, yep. And I'm sure whoever listens to this will benefit from it because, like we said, everybody's going through some kind of transition. What's that? Ario Speedwagon, roll with the changes. Yep, roll with the changes. <laughs> exactly. Good Thank you so much, James. Take care. All right. That was our interview with Dr. Marty Maidenberg. Hopefully you enjoyed our conversation and just realized that we're all going through transitions in life and there is a bright side to most things. So please take that with you. If you need anything from us on the Freedom From Anger side, please visit our website freedomanger.com we have numerous classes to try to educate yourself coping skills and with grief and a myriad of other things but hope you uh, tune in next time because it's only going to get better and as always stay safe